wrestling fans in the Eastern Hemisphere, you officially have my respect. So yes, Thursday was uh, New Japan's Wrestle Kingdom 12 in the Tokyo Dome. And, you know, like I said, the hype for this show last few months has just been unreal. It was already a serious hype going into it. And then when Chris Jericho got added to the show, fighting Kenny Omega, then it just shot way up. And I think that played a huge role in this show being just this huge deal here in America. I think when you combine that and also, you know, the Bullet Club invading Hot Topic and the G1 special in Los Angeles last year and the news they were making an official New Japan and Fire Pro Wrestling game. I feel like New Japan has never been more relevant to the mainstream wrestling culture than it is right now. So this is a big, I think a pivotal shift, a, piv a pivotal moment in New Japan's history that we saw at Wrestle Kingdom 12. So I'm going to give you my thoughts right now. I will admit though that my frame of reference for this show is going to be a bit limited because I honestly don't know everyone in New Japan. I get, you know, I know the big players. I know them and their backstories and stuff, but I don't watch a lot of New Japan outside like the big shows. I've watched the last few Wrestle Kingdom I watched the G1 special in USA, so that's the most I've watched in New Japan as of late. So I'm not going to know who everyone is or why necessarily everyone is fighting. I got the gist of it in a lot of those pre-match promo packages, so I'm going to just give you observations from what I saw in the matches, and I, I'm not going to try and break down storylines per se. I did listen to the English commentary for this show, and I know that some people will say, you got to listen to the Japanese commentary, it's the best. Well, look, I like context in my commentary. I like understanding what's being said. I know that the Japanese uh, commentary is far more passionate than Kevin Kelly and Don Callis at times, but I just I feel more comfortable and more at peace listening and hearing what they have to say, just so I understand what the context of everything is. Because there were some points where if I listen to Japanese commentary, I have no idea what's going on. Uh, Kevin Kelly and Don Callis were all right on commentary, better than JR and Josh Barnett, in my opinion. But uh, the one thing that got on my nerves early on, they really scaled this back as the show went on. They, they really were pretty heavy handed on the use of like inside terms they would say you know mark and shoot and work like we get it okay wink nudge we all know we're all in on the act but by the end of the show they really scaled back on that so that was nice let's talk for a minute about the new japan rumble in the pre-show i honestly actually didn't watch this whole match i jumped in in the middle of it right before cheeseburger's entrance and i love the reaction the crowd gave the cheeseburger it's great he does nothing in the rumble similar to last year he just does nothing he gets eliminated he leaves but the fans love him and i think that next year this is a bold prediction you can write this one down and put it in bold and write it in the sky. This is my prediction that Cheeseburger will win next year's New Japan Rumble. That is my bold prediction. Of course, it was not Cheeseburger's night on Thursday. The winner of the Rumble was Masahito Kakihara, who I honestly don't know anything about, although I gathered from the commentary that he is a cancer survivor. So for him to come back from cancer and still be active and wrestle in this match and win in the Rumble, that was a really cool uh, thing to see. And uh, yeah, that was really kind of feel good way to end the pre-show. The first official matches for the IWGP Junior Tag Titles as uh, Rapongi. 3K, Show and Yo, accompanied by Rocky Romero, are defending against the Young Bucks, Matt and Nick Jackson. All about this match, I had to keep reminding myself, this is the style now. This, this is the way things have evolved. This, this is the style now. The, the style. This is how was what we come to in wrestling. Just a bunch of big ass moves. No one's selling. You, the finish could come at literally any time because every move is a finish. Like Brian Alvarez tweeted after this match, like, did the finish feel like it came out of nowhere? Like, I mean, not really because every move in this match looked like a finish. So really could have came at any time as far as I was concerned. I, I will say though, the the Bucks were uh, they did seem a little subdued in this. There wasn't as much super kicking between Matt and Nick as I feel there usually is that they're known for there were plenty of super kicks don't get me wrong but it didn't seem as frequent it was like concentrated into like one part like near the middle and kind of near the end as well but it didn't feel like it was dominating the discussion so to speak there's lots of selling in the back in this match especially from show and matt jackson in fact uh that missed plancha by show at the beginning of the match looked painful as hell and i don't know if there was a welt on his back or something i saw it looked like a big bulge in his back as a result of it i could have been wrong might have just been like a back muscle of his that was lit a certain way but and this is a recurring theme in this show this happens almost every match in this show save for the main event where it's like there's a big thing that happens like in the first minute or two of the match where there's like a big like grievous looking injury where someone looks really fucked up or like there's a, a move where like, uh, the finish happens and you think the match is going to end right away and then there's it goes the rest of the match from there on like these fault these these moments of false like hope of a finish or like false oh my god this person's been injured until the heel gets up and just heals on him some more that's when you know they're okay the fact that the wrestler's picking them up and just doing more shit to them like happened with show because i thought you know it could have been the end of that match right there or the end of his run but then that happened almost every match on this show and i don't think that's a coincidence i think it's a, a deliberate uh booking style matchmaking style 
by uh, by Gato and those in charge of New Japan, which I, I did get kind of old after a while, I have to say. The match ends when Nick puts a sharpshooter on Yo, who has no choice but to tap out. So the Bucks win the match and become seven-time junior tag team champions, which is a great accomplishment for them. Uh, and, you know, this is the way uh, Wrestle Kingdom's run. The opening match is always for the junior tag titles. It's to help, you know, really get the crowd going with a fast-paced style of match. And I think this one really delivered. Uh, you yeah, know, you can say what you want with the Young Bucks as their style of wrestling, but uh, they are are probably one of the most influential tag teams out there right now and this match I think was a great one for their resume. Up next the gauntlet match for the never six man tag team championships. Honestly there were so many people involved in this match and so much going on I didn't want to bog myself down like trying to take notes for every detail that happened so I don't have much to say about the match itself. Uh, you know it was a good match if not chaotic at times. I will say it was so awkward to see Michael Elgin teaming with War Machine here because those two sides hate each other. There's no secret about that. Just a couple weeks ago I saw a video of War Machine yelling right in the camera, fuck Michael Elgin. So there's definitely some animosity there. You know, just good to see Michael Elgin getting some work <laughs> these days. He's been uh, kicked off of so many indie shows on the state side. So I think this might be his last run in New Japan if, if what I've heard is to be believed though. Beretta, Toru Yanu, and Ishii defeat the uh, Bullet Club, which is Fale and the Grills of Destiny, to become the new six-man tag team champions. So great redemption for Beretta, who you know, is his first championship as a heavyweight in New Japan. Great redemption for a guy who was really a blip on the radar in WWE, didn't really do much with his time there. Although I was confused because I always thought that when Rapongi Vice split up last year in LA that it was implied that Beretta would go on his own as a singles guy in the heavyweight division, but here he is, like, back in a tag team situation again. Maybe I maybe I misheard what Rocky said in his goodbye speech or his split-up speech in L.A., but uh, that's just something I noticed for, with Trent. And speaking of WWE, here are two guys who left that company on their own terms and walked away from it and honestly did better for themselves in the long run as a result. You got Cody taking on Kota Ibushi. I love uh, Cody here. He's such a great cartoon villain now, and it's so over the top. And this match was great as as well. They're just super athletic, really fun to watch just the stuff they did with each other. I love uh, Ibushi's work at the Cruiserweight Classic, for example. That's the most exposure I've had to him. So him and Cody Rhodes here working this match was just so much, so enjoyable to watch. I did love this point early in the match where Ibushi does a big crossbody off the top onto Cody and Brandy Rhodes. Brandy took more of that. She took pretty much all that impact from Ibushi. So she's down and he's all distracted and that allows Cody to heal on him and, and beat him up and throw him back in the ring. And then, then uh, Cody and Brandy had this moment where they're laughing together. Like, ah, we sure got him there. But like Brandy has to go back to selling her neck. Like, oh, like, oh, I'm hurt still. But oh, it was all part of the plan. At one point, Cody hits the crossroads onto Ibushi off the apron onto the floor. And Jesus, that looked ridiculous. It looked so scary. It's easily the scariest bump of the match and definitely one of the top ones of the whole show, of which there were several scary looking bumps. So eventually Ibushi does win with the Phoenix Splash. But yeah, great story told here. I guess I love Cody Rhodes in this full on on like uh, heel mode with the bleach blonde hair and everything, kiss the ring and all that. Uh, great work by this in this match. IWGP Heavyweight Tag Titles on the line as the Killer Elite Squad defend against Evil and Sonata. Don't know much about the backstory in this matchup. I don't know much about the characters involved. I do know obviously with you know Davey Boy Smith Jr., the son of the British Bulldog. He was David Hart Smith, team with Tyson Kidd in WWE. And then you know uh, Archer, of course, was used formerly Lance Hoyt in TNA. Uh, but I don't know much of their work outside of that bubble since they've become the Killer Elite Squad. But I, I do like their stuff here. They are great hard-hitting heels. I love in the intro, Archer's like, he's like spitting water at people, throwing water at people all throughout his entrance. He's like spamming people with water. Uh, he choke slams evil onto the young boys during the match. It's not the first time we'd see the young boys on the outside of the ring take a fair amount of abuse throughout this show. But like I said, Archer and Smith are just nasty heels, hard-hitting heels. It is a fun match to watch. Uh, evil and Sonata win the tag titles and like so many championships changing hands on this show. And it's not the last time it's going to happen. Up next, Hiroki Goto versus Minoru Suzuki in a hair versus hair match for the never title uh, early in the match like I said there's this trend of moments where like oh is he dead no let's keep wrestling that's what happens here because Goto passes out in a hanging sleeper in the first few minutes and he's just like he's out for a long time and I, you know the whole thing is he really passed out is he really unconscious but yeah that's the go ongoing trend with this whole thing it's okay to use that 
sparingly. Like, sprinkle it out throughout the show. Don't spam the viewers and the audience with this moment in every match because then it just it's, it's it becomes as formulaic as you know, like face heat, heel heat, come back, you know, leg drop, etc. That's you know a crude example, but you get my point. But yeah, this is definitely your hard hitting, strong style, badass segment of the night. You know, in the first part of the show, there's the tag team stuff, there's the six man tag, then there's the heavyweight tag, and now here's the strong style portion of the show for you on the menu tonight. But yeah, a lot of the hard hitting moments. Uh, you know, Goto gets hit with some slaps by Suzuki, and then a stiff looking drop hit by Suzuki. It almost knocks uh, Goto a clean out. They exchange some sick forearms, ending with a Goto headbutt, followed by an inverted GTR, then a regular GTR for Goto to win the match and become the new champion. Again, another title change. But then Suzuki, of course, the stipulation is a hair match, but Suzuki does not want to give Goto the satisfaction, and for his own pride and honor, shaves his own head, that back tuft he has, which honestly, I think is an improvement. In a match for the junior heavyweight title, Marty Skrull, the Birdman with his new wings, takes on Will Ospreay, Kushida, and Takahashi. And I will say, it's hard to really pick out what the match of the night for this show was, because there were a few candidates, and this one was certainly one of them. This had, was just balls to the wall the entire time. Such insane, innovative offense of the whole thing. At one point, Will Ospreay climbs up like a lighting rig and does a moonsault into everybody. Uh, this is just a very fun match. Again, lots of stuff here. The too much to call. The match ends when Ospreay hits the os cutter onto his longtime rival, Marty Skrull, pins him, and becomes the new junior heavyweight champion. So that's a big story moment here. The fact that these guys have feuded for so many years, and Ospreay never got the win over Skrull girl and here he finally does on this huge stage wins a championship that was a really cool moment uh, for osprey and yeah it, 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 if you see one match on this show actually if you see one match on the show see jericho and omega but if you see two matches on this show see jericho and omega and then this match here because this was easily one of the top ones of the night it's going to be hard to follow that match but here we go with the intercontinental championship as tanahashi defense against switchblade jay white now i'm not all familiar as to why Jay White became Switchblade. I don't follow Ring of Honor, so I don't get that whole story, but I did dig the look and the gimmick and like the, the hype package that they showed him in there with the, the knife and everything. So it was a cool look for Jay White here. It is a bit of a slower match than the last one. It is hard, like I said, hard to follow what we saw in that four man, but it was no less hard hitting. It's a classic young versus old story. The story with Tanahashi being, he's been in the ring for so long. Can he still hang with the, these young lions? And here comes Jay White trying to demand respect and he wants to beat the respect out of Tanahashi. And he certainly almost does that because at one point he just slams, just, just jacks Tanahashi head and neck area right in the apron of the ring like it's kind of a suplex into a brain buster i don't know if you could call that a brain buster this looks like he's fucking his neck up on the apron uh, tanahashi retains with the high fly flow at the end of the match another it's a great match there's really no bad matches subpar matches on this show uh it's not the same kind of match as the four-way but it's still a very solid entertaining match this is the match i stayed up all night to watch a no dq match for the u.s championship at alpha versus omega chris jericho versus kenny omega this was, I mean, I'll say right off the bat, this was a tremendous match. An amazing match that absolutely delivered and lived up to the hype. It is weird to see Jericho coming out with music that isn't Break the Walls Down. He came out to a Kafazi song, but God, for ever since 1999, he's been coming out to Break the Walls Down, except for like a two-week span when he came out to a Saliva song. But that's all we've known with Jericho for a long time. So for him to come out something different, definitely felt like, oh, this is not the Chris Jericho that we're used to here. Omega is dressed up as some kind of like Anubis figure with a big paper mache gun. I like this Terminator stick from last year better. The match starts out pretty fast and furious. This is not a technical matchup here. This is a brawl. This is a war. Omega dives to the outside where Jericho is, but Jericho gets out of the way and Omega just dies. Just like splats right into the uh, uh, English announce table. And then for like a couple minutes, we're just dark on English commentary. We don't hear Kevin or Don Callis for a good portion after this. And then even when they get the mics back up, they're just going, are we on? Can you can you hear us? What's going on? It's this madness ensuing in the commentary. But during all this all this chaos, you see Jericho decking the referee, Red Shoes. Then he puts Red Shoes' son, who's a young lion, in the lion tamer. Not the walls of Jericho. No, no, no. The lion tamer with the knee. What a heel Jericho is being here. He's just so sadistic in this match. It's very reminiscent of his 2008 run in WWE. In the same vein, he punched out Shawn Michaels' wife. But this just feels so much more sadistic uh, in this environment. Because it's not so clean and homogenized like it is in WWE. This feels more gritty and real. There was a lot of confusion in this match because there at, one, at least one point there was a count out being made in the outside of the ring, but also a lot of rope breaks happening in this match. And I think people were saying, well, it's no DQ. Why are there rope breaks? I think the the way the rules work with when, you, when you're in the ropes, you're technically out of the ring, or at least part of you is out of the ring. You can't pin somebody 
if they are out of the ring or partly out of the ring. This is not a false count anywhere match. It's no DQ. So I guess, you know, rope breaks, technically you can't be enforced. You can't like tell them to break the hold, but they do count as a way to kind of like invalidate uh, you know, pinfalls at the very least. So I get why they, you know, it, it's, it's, that's probably the best answer I can come up with as to why rope breaks were kind of being enforced here. It was, it felt pretty selective at times, but yeah, that seemed to be the biggest hiccup I saw people talk about online was why are there rope breaks in this no DQ match? One of my favorite parts of the matchup is this hope spot for Kenny Omega where he reaches down while he's in the walls. He reaches down under the apron to grab this can of cold spray and then he sprays Jericho in the face with it and temporarily blinds him. And then while Jericho's selling, Kenny sprays him himself down and sprays himself in the crotch. He's like, oh, pretty funny look by Kenny Omega there. But then Jericho later on tosses Omega into a chair that was set up uh, in the corner uh, several minutes before multiple times and eventually just breaks the chair off on Kenny's head. This is just like a side of Jericho we had not seen. This is not the drink it in man uh, list writing Chris Jericho we saw just several, just a few months ago, just last year. This is a wildly different Chris Jericho. He's full blown heel. He's just so sadistic like I mentioned. And throughout the whole thing, Jericho has the crowd in the palm of his hand. Every time he looks out of the crowd or gestures to them, the crowd is just raining booze down upon Jericho. He's doing his job exceedingly well here in this match. But at one point, he's on the top rope and he gets uh, V triggered off through a table on the outside. He gets a laceration near his ass. I'm going to call that an asseration. A lot of V triggers here by Omega. He does go for a one winged angel, but, he, uh, but Jericho counters it into the walls, then transitions into a lion tamer. I thought that was going to be it, but Omega manages to escape that hold. More V triggers. Another one winged angel. This time to connect, but it's a rope break. At the last second, Jericho grabs the rope. And I thought, oh, it would have been perfect. It would have been so poetic if instead of just grabbing it, he did what Kevin Owens did earlier this year and just used the fingertip to get the rope break. That would have been pretty brilliant. The match ends when Chris goes for another lion's salt, but then Kenny gets up, throws the chair at Jericho, hits him with a one-winged angel, onto the chair for Omega to win and retain the U.S. Championship. Like I said, go out of your way to watch this match any way you can. If you have to order a subscription to the New Japan World, which I suggest you do, then you should do it because this was easily one of the top matches of the night. It gets, I think it's already an early, early contender for match of the year, much like Omega and Okada was this time last year. It was definitely a different match than what we're used to seeing, from, especially from Kenny Omega. And like in the, in the grand scheme of things, this whole show, this match, stood out as being wildly different from everything else because it was the most violent, it was the most like hardcore, easily the most bloody. Uh, so yeah, it was definitely a different match but I don't think it really, like it didn't stay like a sore thumb. It wasn't in a bad way of sticking out. This was just like it was helping enhance the spice and the flavor of the rest of the show. This was just something that like stood out on its own. I think it did really well. Again, Omega did great for a match that's not his typical style and Jericho looks great here. It's amazing that in 2018, Jericho is still able to reinvent himself and keep himself relevant and still be a top draw this late into his career. That's amazing. Main event time for the IWGP heavyweight title as Kazuchika Okada defends against Tetsuya Naito. Uh, Okada's wearing pants now. That's a new development. Kind of distracting. Also distracting was in the first couple of minutes of the match you would see like up at the entrance ramp area, you'd see a bunch of crew members like strike, going very fast and hustling to fill these bags up with all the money that fell. Like they're just trying to pick up their litter and stuff. Like they're just stuffing the bags with all the fake money. It was pretty funny. These guys are just so good. Everything they do is so clean and so crisp and just connect so well. So hard hitting, a great physical work between these two guys here. Story, the story here later in the match is just the fatigue that comes into play, how much they're just beating the hell out of each other. You see they're kind of trading forearms and Okada's just getting so sluggish, so like he's not putting any oomph into his forearms. That leads to him getting slapped, uh, first spit on by Naito, then getting slapped in the face and just taken down with a slap. That's how tired he is and how Naito feels disrespected by the, the weak sauceness of the forearms. But of course, it wouldn't be a high stakes match in New Japan without a bunch of finisher kickouts. That happened a lot here. Uh, Okada kicks out of a lot of Destinos, and uh, Naito kicks out of a bunch of Rainmakers, so that happens pretty frequently here. The match ends when Naito goes for a, I think, third or fourth Destino at this point, but Okada counters it into a tombstone, a Rainmaker that turns Naito inside out, pinfall, and that's the match. Okada retains and holds on to the heavyweight championship. Really good match. Not quite the level, in my opinion, of Jericho and Omega. I still think that Alpha versus Omega should have been the main event just because of like the hype surrounding it and the fact that it is so unique to see Jericho back in Japan. And also, just in hindsight, there's no way that Okada and Naito could have followed up that match. They, could have, they couldn't have topped it, but they held their own. It was still a very good match. I just think that 
end on like this big crescendo moment with Alpha and Omega in the main event. So my overall grade for Wrestle Kingdom 12 is a solid A grade. There was really not a bad match on this card. There were a couple I didn't really care that much about or weren't really into. That was Tanahashi versus Switchblade and Goto versus Suzuki. But yeah, they were still good matches, just not my cup of tea watching them. My favorite matches for the whole show were Cody Rhodes and Ibushi, the Junior Heavyweight Fatal 4-Way match. That was just awesome stuff. Again, I you seek, you seek that match out, as well as Jericho versus Omega. Those are the top three matches, in my opinion, on this show. And the one thing I have on this show that's not going to affect the grade too much, again, is the recurring theme of, like, dead outside the ring, but still managed to finish off. This happens in the first, like, three minutes of every match, except for the main event, really. And that, again, that's kind of like, I noticed it, and it's a pattern that I thought was getting kind of annoying after a while. There was always something for everyone watching this show. There was some hardcore, there was some strong style, there was some technical, there was high flying, there was brawling, there was even some comedy stuff with Toru Yanu. You know, it was a long show, and for us, you know, Western Hemisphere folks, I, know I can't complain about it, I have no right to complain about it. It's a long show that's late, but it was still very entertaining throughout. For all the hype surrounding New Japan at the moment, you know that they knew they just had to hit an absolute home run on this show, and I think they totally delivered. You know, it sounds like they picked up a lot of New Japan World subscriptions on the build of the show, especially based off of the announcement of Chris Jericho joining, so I think this could be the show that really helps define the future of New Japan in the years to come. So let me know what you guys thought about Wrestle Kingdom 12 in the comments section below. And once again, all of my uh, fans and viewers on the other side of the Atlantic, I feel your pain now. I get it. I can't complain about the, the, the late start time for this show on the West Coast because you guys deal with that every week for Raw and SmackDown. I totally get it. So anyway, leave a thumbs up for this video if you like it. Subscribe to Wrestling With Regret and buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.